Today, the cement of NASCAR is pretty much set. Most of the all-time records were set decades ago and have remained etched in stone ever since. On top of that, it seems like all the major feats in the sport have been obtained as well. Seven championships is pretty much the limit of what any driver is capable of. 200 wins in the top division will never be surpassed due to rule changes. 13 wins in a season is all but untouchable in the modern era. And it honestly seems like there are no more dragons left to slay in the NASCAR landscape. But one accomplishment is so tantalizingly close that the fact that nobody has captured it yet is even more insane than the actual achievement itself, the ever-elusive Daytona Triple, winning all three top-tier series events of Speed Weeks. Since 1979, Speed Weeks has consisted of three events to kick off the season in earnest. The Clash, the Qualifying Duels, and the Daytona 500. The Clash is the newest of the three. Originally billed as the fastest race of the year, it was a 20-lap invitational race in which all the pole winners of the previous year would compete against one another in a dash for cash. $50,000 to the winner, a stupid amount of money for such a short day at the office, reminiscent of Saturday night features at local short tracks all across the southeast. Needless to say, it was an instant hit. Since then, the rules of who is invited and the format of the race itself have changed a lot. But the basic purpose of the race still remains the same. Get a bunch of fast and fearless drivers, dangle a big cash prize in front of them, turn them loose, and just see what happens. The qualifying races, known as the duels, have been around since the Daytona 500's inception in 1959. With so many drivers showing up and trying to make the field, qualifying races were run to determine who got in and who had to go home. Your starting position in the duels were set by single lap time trials, and the duels were at first 125 miles, but are now 150 miles. Duel 1 set the inside column, and Duel 2 set the outside. The top two from time trials were locked in, but everybody else had to finish inside the cutoff line. The field size, how many lock-ins are available, and other rules of the qualifiers have changed over the years, but needless to say, the qualifying races are filled with a lot of drama, as guys with slower cars try to use their technical mastery and savvy strategy to get into the main event. The Daytona 500 on Sunday is the crown jewel event not only of Speed Weeks, but of the entire year. Historically, it is one of, if not the highest paying race event of the season, as well as being the most viewed. Safe to say the Daytona 500 is a big frickin' deal. You win a couple of those and people are already talking about Hall of Fame status. But since the Clash was introduced in 1979, no one has won all three in the same year. It seems pretty easy compared to some of the other records already set in NASCAR. Richard Petty won 10 races in a row in 1967. Jimmy Johnson won five championships in a row from 2006 to 2010. So winning three races in two weeks should be a piece of cake, right? Especially considering that all three events are run on the same track within eight days of one another. Hell, historically speaking, it's actually pretty common that guys run the same car in all three events. So why has nobody pulled this off yet? Honestly, it seems like the achievement is almost cursed in some way. The absolute kiss of death going into the Daytona 500 is to have won the Clash and your qualifying race beforehand. Statistically speaking, you're not just likely to lose the 500, but lose it in probably the worst way you could possibly imagine. Like your hopes and dreams aren't just crushed, your car is too, and you finished damn near last. In the very first running of the Triple in 1979, Buddy Baker won the Clash, his qualifier, and then in the 500, he never led a single lap under green. And by the time the first caution came out, his engine blew up, and he finished second to last and 40th. In 1981, Darrell Waltrip did the same thing, won the first two, and then DNF'd in the 500 and 36th. In 1983, Neil Bonnet won the Clash in the qualifier and finished 22nd, 13 laps down in the 500. Dale Earnhardt in 1986 swept everything before the 500 and ended up in 14th in the main event with a blown engine late in the race. More often than not, winning the first two races meant that you were going to end speed weeks with a crushing defeat in the 500. And don't think this curse just applied to the 80s. In 2003, Dale Jr. was poised to win all three and finished 36th, 92 laps down in the 500. In 2007, Tony Stewart was in the same boat and wrecked out and finished dead last. My only solution for lifting this curse is to either be Dale Earnhardt, Ken Schrader, or Denny Hamlin. In 1989, Ken Schrader won the first two but finished second in the 500. In 1991, 93, and 95, Dale Earnhardt finished fifth, second, and second, respectively. In 2014, Denny Hamlin finished second to Dale Jr. Now, while these guys did have as close to a perfect speed weeks as anybody ever has up to this point, with that comes its own sort of hell. Perfection was right there. You could see it right there in front of your own eyes, and what made it even more excruciating was you often needed just one more lap to seal the deal. In 1989, Darrell Waltrip won the 500 in his 17th attempt, and he did it on fuel mileage. As soon as he took the white flag, the engine began to sputter, but would always come back just long enough for him to remain at speed. 
He took the checkered flag on fumes. What's even crazier about that win was the only reason he was able to pull it off was because NASCAR had confiscated his carburetor in pre-race tech inspection. So in his haste, Darrell Waltrip's crew chief, Jeff Hammond, put on a carburetor that produced less power, but also consumed slightly less fuel. That, combined with Daryl's wife Stevie begging Jeff Hammond to make the call to go for it on fuel, are the only things that kept Schrader away from the record books. But the mental torture doesn't end there. In 1991, Dale Earnhardt was looking to pull off the triple and was leading the 500 when he hit a seagull and had to settle for fifth after repairs. In 1993, Dale Jarrett made a last lap pass on Earnhardt to further the Intimidator's bad luck at the Great American Race. It was just Jarrett's second victory of his entire career. In 1995, Earnhardt pitted for tires late when nobody else did, in a gamble for better handling, but it put him way behind. In a brilliant display of driving and tenacity, Earnhardt cut his way through the field, picking apart every single driver but one. He came up just one lap short. Sterling Marlin took the win and became just the second driver ever to win back-to-back -back 500s. In 2011, Kurt Busch had been shuffled around to the 22 team to utilize his champion's provisional, but he wouldn't need it. He won the clash and the duel, but finished a distant fifth to Trevor Bain, who became the youngest Daytona 500 winner in history. That's how the curse works. You either crash out and go home early in disgrace, or you watch perfection slip right through your fingers in some unimaginably improbable way. What should have been your greatest achievement usually becomes someone else's landmark victory. In some cases, it can send your entire career into a tailspin. In 2008, Dale Jr. had just moved to Hendrick Motorsports and was set to pull off the triple, but had to settle for ninth. He'd only get one points-paying victory the whole year at Michigan on fuel mileage. After that, he would not get back to victory lane for four years. So will anybody ever pull it all together for speed weeks? It seems inevitable, but looking at the stats and how it always seems to unravel no matter the context, I honestly wouldn't be surprised if I went to my grave having never seen it happen. Think about the guys who had a crack at this. Dale Earnhardt, Dale Jr., Neil Bonnet, Darrell Waltrip, Buddy Baker, Denny Hamlin. All these guys are either in the Hall of Fame or soon will be. They've got hundreds upon hundreds of wins between them, but not the three that count. Now, do we have any likely candidates in the pipeline nowadays? Sure, there are some qualified drivers who could wrap it all up, but it's also worth noting that nobody's been in position to do it since 2014. Denny Hamlin is going for three Daytona 500 wins in a row this year. That would be absolutely nuts, and to pull off the triple in the same year would be a fitting way for this curse to be lifted. But the clash in 2021 is no longer on the Daytona Oval. They're running the infield road course this year, and that shakes up my prediction. Hamlin has just one road course victory at Watkins Glen in 2016, but he did manage to finish second at the Daytona road course event last year. However, my money is on the man that actually won that race, the defending champ, Chase Elliott. Chase has emerged as a road course master as of late. He's won the last four road course races in a row. On top of that, he's won at Talladega, another super speedway like Daytona. He's also won his dual race twice in 2016 and 17. But the 500 is a different beast for him. His best finish in the Great American Race is 14th, and his average finish is an abysmal 23.6. His body of work up to that point is fantastic, but the main event is his Achilles heel. But who knows, maybe winning the first two events will put enough pep in his step to keep him out of trouble and see him walk away with what has to be one of the last great achievements still left to claim in NASCAR. Or maybe an unlikely hero will emerge to take the glory sometime down the road. Only time will tell. Anyway, I'm Slapshoes, thanks for watching, and until next time, y'all take it easy. If you like the music used in this video, it's provided by fellow race fan and music artist G Wiz. You can check out her SoundCloud and Twitter accounts in the pinned comment down below.